Okay, so on the front of your, your prayer list, it says we're going to be in Song of Solomon, chapter 6, verse 1. That's where we're going to start. I understand we have nine minutes. I think I can get through 13 verses in nine minutes. <laughs> Absolutely. Song of Solomon, chapter 6, verse 1. Uh, th this is really, uh, we have two more chapters. We have, well, okay, so 6, 7, and 8. But we'll, we'll finish with chapter 6 tonight, so next week we'll do chapter 7, and we'll be done with Song of Solomon. <clears throat> Song of Solomon, chapter 6. Uh, I didn't put any points in tonight's message. We're going to go through all 13 of these verses. I, I have nine minutes. I think we can get through all 13 of these verses. And, and you, you can see in these verses the love that God is showing to his church and then you can see in these verses the love that the church is returned showing to God. And, and when you read through, specifically like Matthew Henry's commentary, he really points out the fact that, yes, this is a love poem between Solomon and the Shulamite woman, but it is exact representation of God and the church. So uh, Matthew Henry and I agree on this particular instance. Um, so this will not be that hard. We're going to go through Song of Solomon, chapter 6, verse 1, beginning in verse 1. <clears throat> Where has your beloved gone, O fairest among women? Where has your beloved turned aside that we may seek him with you? Oh, man. I can't go to verse 2. Earlier in, in chapter 5, and no, no, baby, it's not that it wouldn't go, it's that I can't go. Sorry. Uh, it's working. We put batteries in it. You were, okay. That's my wife volunteering. And Krista's already back there. <laughs> we're never going to get through 13 verses. All right, so in this particular instance, at the end of chapter 5, he actually had asked, uh, I'm sorry, the Shulamite woman had actually asked her friends if they had seen her beloved. And then they, they actually had re responded in return, like, why is your beloved so special? But in this particular instance, what you see here is you see that those people that she had asked to look for her beloved have actually sought her out and they have begun to ask her, where did he go? We want to come with you and find him. And I want you to think about this for just a second. If this is a love point between Solomon and one of his wives, and this is representation between God and the church, what you see here is the Shulamite woman has actually done what we're supposed to do, and she has gone out and she has told people how good God is, and those people were affected by the Holy Spirit. They came back to the Shulamite woman and said, we want to go with you to find this guy. It's outreach. This is how the, the, the message of God was being spread in, in this particular time. The Shulamite woman went out to tell people how good God was, and those people were affected by the Spirit, and they said, hey, that guy you were talking about, we want, we want to come with you. We want to find him. That's the equivalent of you sharing your testimony with one of your friends, with one of your neighbors, with one of your co-workers, and then them coming back to you and saying, man, that's a great story. Can I go to church? Woohoo! Song of Solomon, chapter 6, verse 1. Share what you know about God, and it affects people. That's not a point. Verse 2. My beloved has gone to his garden, to the beds of spices, to feed his flock in the gardens, and to gather lilies. Now this is the Shulamite woman saying, I know exactly where my God is. He has gone to his garden. His garden, ladies and gentlemen, the church. This is the Shulamite woman being asked by her friends, where is this God that you speak of? And she said, in his house. No stuttering, no stammering, no, well, I don't really know where God's at. Not one of those questions where your, people, your friends will come up to you and say, hey, can you tell me where God is? And like, well, it's a spiritual place that's outside the physical place that we like to call heaven that exists somewhere that you can't see and you can't touch and you can't taste. That's not what the Shulamite woman said. They said, where is God? And she said, in his house. Amen? Isn't that a wonderful answer? Hey, I want to meet this God you're talking about. Where is he at? He's at church. Church is open, by the way. Well, what if it's not open? Call the preacher. He'll meet you up here. <laughs> Call one of the deacons. I bet they'll meet you up here, too. I can't express how many times I've had to text Miss Linda and say, Miss Linda, can, can Jimmy come and open the church because I don't have a key or because somebody's supposed to meet me there? And what does Linda always say? He's on his way. Where's God at? He's in his house. People should know that he's here. Because we're telling them that he's here. They shouldn't have to guess. 
They shouldn't be surprised by that. We should be so enamored with our love for God that it spills out in our very speech, in our actions. Verse 3. Never going to make it. I am my beloved, and my beloved is mine. He feeds his flock among the lilies. Now, this is a spiritual application here. Where do you go to get fed? You go to the garden of God. Where's the garden? His church. What does he feed you? Lilies. Not grass, not hay, not bahia, not seeds. Flowers. He feeds you in his house his love. His grace, his kindness. He feeds you different than the rest of the world gets fed. And it results in us being different than the rest of the world. Verse 4. Oh, my love, you are as beautiful as Tazar, lovely as Jerusalem, awesome as an army with banners. Now, ladies, he's complimenting you. Tazar. Tazah is, is a village on the mountain plains. So it's in an elevated place that is known for being luscious and green. Jerusalem, Jerusalem was the town center for the house of God. It was supposedly the most spectacular place in all of the world. If you asked a Jew in this day, Jerusalem was the most perfect place in the world. And he's saying that when I look down from heaven, I see you as beautiful as that elevated village with the lush green foliage. I see you as beautiful as the golden temple that was built in my honor. This is how God is saying he sees new colony. When he looks down from heaven, we're beautiful and awesome. Why? Because we're in his house doing his will. Notice there's an exclamation point at the end of that. I know you ladies probably wouldn't like for me to say, Oh, your hair looks like it's an army with banners. <laughs> yes, lovey, I was talking to you. <laughs> But in this particular instance, remember, he's pointing out how beautiful it is to be a child of God, of which we all claim to be. Verse 5. Turn your eyes away from me, for they have overcome me. Your hair is like a flock of goats going down from Gilead. Again, ladies, it's a rough translation here. He's telling you how beautiful you look. All right, Brother Kurt, you killed it. <laughs> <laughs> He's telling them that, 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 and you can think about it for a moment if you want, but that, that flock of goats provided uh, the wool and the skins and the, the clothing so that they would have warm things in the winter and the meat so that they could have something to eat. So that flock of goats actually sustained their lives, and he's saying that when I see you, you're sustaining life. <laughs> Marriage counseling starts tomorrow. <laughs> Verse 6. <clears throat> You're I love you guys. I love that you can laugh. I do. <clears throat> Verse 6 isn't going to help you much. Your teeth are like a flock of sheep, which have come up from washing. Every one bears twins. He's talking about teeth. You got one on the left, you got one on the right. Both there. Ladies, he's saying he likes your pearly whites. And then he says, none of them is barren among you. Which makes reference to something else. Verse 7. Oh, went to verse 8. Like a piece of pomegranate are your temples behind your veil. <laughs> Notice in these, in these verses, God is looking down from heaven and he's describing his church as being lovely. Amen. Verse 8. There are 60 queens and 80 concubines and virgins without numbers. There's a bunch of people, he says. There's a bunch of people. A bunch of very important people, some people who are below them. There's a bunch of them, and below them, there's a bunch more people. There's a bunch of people. Verse 9. My dove, my perfect one, is the only one. Of all of those people, you're the one. You're the one for me. And keep in mind, he's not talking about a specific woman here. He's talking about the church. That's us. God's looking down from heaven and he's saying, you 
are beautiful, you're lovely, and you're the one. You're the one that I'm willing to die for. And he did. Verse 10. I'm sorry, continuing in verse 9, it goes on. The daughters saw her and called her blessed. The queens and the concubines, and they praised her. They, they, all of those people who were so important, they see the beauty of the church, and they appreciate it. No jealousy there. They appreciate the beauty of the church. People in our community should be that way because when they see us, we act like Christians, and when we interact with them, they appreciate the fact that we act different than the rest of the world acts. Amen? Amen. Verse 10. Who is she who looks forth as the morning, fair as the moon, clear as the sun, awesome as an army with banners? Who is she? Who are we? Who, who, who are we when we leave the house of God? Do we leave here as that beautiful person that he sees us as? Or when we, leaving, when we leave here, do we go back to just acting like the rest of the world? It's an important question we need to ask ourselves. When you get out of bed in the morning, who am I? The answer, a child of God. What does that do? It affects everything you do for the rest of that day because you are a child of God. Verse 11, we're getting close. I went down to the garden of nuts to see the vendor of the valley. Verdin, verd, verdu, verdu. Does anybody know what that word means? I looked it up. You know what it means? Green and luscious. <laughs> I didn't know what that word meant until I looked it up today. I must have overread that I don't know how many times, paying no attention to that word. I guess I just skipped it. So I finally looked it up today. So he went down to the garden to see if it was lush, if it was full. He's coming down to the family of God. He's coming down to the house of God. And what does he want to see when he gets here? He wants to see if we're lush. He wants to see if we're, if we're bountiful. He wants to see if we're doing what we were created to do, to see whether the vine had budded and the pomegranates had bloomed. He came down to see if we were doing what we were supposed to do, and boom, we were. He caught us being Christian. He caught us doing what we were created to do. I oh, wish we could always say that. You ever catch yourself in the middle of the day going, whoo, I'm glad God wasn't watching just then. He is, yeah. We thought we got away with it, but we didn't. Verse 12, getting close. Before I was even aware, my soul had made me as the chariots of my noble people. Before I even was aware, God changed my heart. And it was no longer that cold, hard, angry heart that the world had shaped it into, and it had become a chariot of noble people. Think about that. The chariot is what carries the people. The chariot is not what is celebrated. The chariot does the work. The chariot gets drugged behind the horse where the manure falls. There's a, there's a spiritual application here to the changing of your heart to being useful, not for your own benefit, but for the glory of God. Verse 13. Return, return, O Shulamite. Return, return, that we may look upon you. Exclamation point. This woman who had come to her friends and said, Help me find my beloved. Her friends had returned to her and said, Where is your beloved? We want to find him too. Come back and tell us more. What would you see in the Shulamite, as it were, the dance of two camps? Spiritually speaking here, they started to get a little off market, off topic here. But notice... That in the beginning of this, in chapter 5, she had gone to her friends and she was seeking out their help. And now, at the end of chapter 6, they're looking for her. Why? Because a Christian will be seen and different than the rest of the world. And when the world faces chaos, we are supposed to stand strong so they can see we're worthy. Shall we bow our heads and pray? Dear Heavenly Father, Thank you, dear God, for blessing us with an opportunity to come in your house, to go through our prayer list, to pray for these people who are near and dear to our hearts, 
to open your Bible and to study your word. Be with us, dear God. Change our hearts to be more receptive of your word. And bless us, dear God, so that we can continue to do this work until you return. Amen. Six minutes late. I apologize. <laughs>